Hey, good afternoon, Temple Terrace Church. Thank you for being with us on this Sunday afternoon to continue our study in the Gospel of Luke. And so we're happy to have you with us. And if you are visiting from other parts of Tampa Bay today or from other parts of these United States, welcome. Thank you for studying the Bible with us. Thank you especially for studying this wonderful narrative out of the Gospel of Luke that we're going to look at today. Extremely important section that we're going to consider for a few minutes this afternoon. You know, going home is always, always special, especially when you go home for the first time. When you leave for college and then go home for the first time, that's very special. After college, when you get your first job and then go home for the first time, that's special. After you get the first job and then you go home after you are married, that is a very special time. And then when you're married and you go home after you have your first child, that is extremely special, isn't it? Going home is special. Well, in our study today, Jesus goes home. He goes home to Nazareth. You can see the images of what this little community of Nazareth might have looked like in the first century. And you would think that when Jesus goes home to Nazareth, that there would have been a parade, that they would have given him the key to the city. You would think maybe that they would dedicate a museum in his honor. You'd think maybe that there would be signs at the entry of the city that would say, Nazareth, home of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was the hometown boy made good from a hometown where very little good usually happened. And so you know that in John chapter 1, when they are told, we have found him of whom Moses and the prophet spake, he is Jesus of Nazareth, the natural response was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? But something good, someone good had come from Nazareth. And now Jesus is coming home. It's really important, I think, that we read this together. Do you have your Bible this afternoon? I want us to read in Luke chapter 4, and I want you to read this narrative with me, beginning in verse 16. This is critically important. This is a, such an important piece of the puzzle, and so I want you to read it carefully with me. Let's do that. Luke 4, verse 16, beginning, Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. He was handed the book of I, the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then Jesus closed the book and gave it back to the attendant. And he sat down. The eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and were amazed at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. But then they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And Jesus said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard you have done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you that no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you the truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months. And there was great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him up to the brow, the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. And then passing through the midst of them, Jesus went his way. Wow, that is such an important such an extremely section of scripture, ladies and gentlemen. In the early parts of the book of Luke, you have <clears throat> these opening chapters, you have beginnings, you have introductions, you have firsts that lay a foundation for the remainder of the book. And so we've taken a lot of time here at the beginning because these stories are essential to the rest of the story. And so you have these introductions. You have Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary and Joseph. And you have the beginning of the ministry of John the baptizer. And you have the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And you have Jesus' baptism. And then you have Jesus' temptation. And then there is one more 
foundational story, and it's what we just read to you, when Jesus goes home to Nazareth in Galilee. And what occurs in that story is foundational. It is a glimpse. It's a precursor into what Jesus is going to do in his ministry. Have you ever thought about it that way? Just study with me for a few minutes about that. Now, <clears throat> this is the beginning of Jesus' about 34-month ministry. But 20 of those months are going to be spent in Galilee. In fact, this section of his life is so long that theologians, when they write about it, typically divide it into the early, middle, and latter Galilean ministry. Because for 20 of his 34 months that he works, he's going to be up in this region of the land. Now, Galilee was and is beautiful. It is still beautiful today. It is much different than southern Israel. And so this area is farmland. It's green. It's lush. It is 60 miles wide. It's 30 miles long. And it is extremely productive. In the first century, it was. In the first century, there was a thriving fishing industry there. And they grew grapes and olives and dates and wheat and figs. And because of that, trade routes developed. Because of all the produce, trade routes developed. And that was important to the ministry of Jesus because it allowed Jesus' fame to spread from one end of the land to the other. These individuals traveled the roads and they carried news about Jesus' ministry, about his teaching, and about his miracles. So much so that the text says, a report about Jesus went throughout all the surrounding country. They were talking about him. You can imagine those conversations. You know how some of those must have gone. Hey, did you hear about Jesus? Jesus, you, you mean the guy who used to live down the street from me? Yes, that, that Jesus. You're not going to believe this. I mean, you're not going to believe this. But I heard from a friend who heard from a friend who was there because her cousin had brought her to the event that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. And when he was baptized, at the heavens opened. And there was a voice that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased Listen to him. you got to be kidding me. Are you sure that's the way that happened? You've got to know there must have been conversations like that. Or, hey, did you, did you hear about Jesus? Jesus? Yeah, you know Jesus, the guy who made my kitchen table. I mean, he, he was at a wedding up in Cana. And everybody's talking about the fact that they ran out of wine at the wedding. And they brought him some water. And he turned the, the water into the best wine anybody had ever tasted. Those stories, ladies and gentlemen, must have been multiplied over and over and over again. The gospel narratives will say that his fame spread in Galilee. Now, it wasn't all ice cream and lemonade. I mean, there, there were some real challenges here. And I, I want to be real honest about that at the very beginning. This was not always easy for Jesus during his ministry. There were three factors that made often his life difficult. One is that in the first year, people began to seek his miracles more than the truth. That's why when you read the Bible carefully, at the end of his first year of ministry, Jesus deliberately curtails the number of miracles and he deliberately begins speaking in parables where he's forcing men and women to think about what he is saying in the application. And then secondly, the religious leaders from Jerusalem, they saw Jesus as a threat. And so they began to come up into Galilee and they would try to undermine his credibility. They would try to say things about him to undermine undermine his credibility with the people. And then third, he began to say that the Messiah's ministry was eventually, ultimately going to include Gentiles as well as Jews. Now we have had, and we continue to have, significant issues of racial division in our country. But we have nothing on the Jew-Gentile division in the first century world in Israel. There was a hatred between those groups that you and I can just hardly begin to fathom. And yet Jesus was teaching to Jews that God ultimately was going to include Gentiles in his kingdom, his dominion of the king. And so it wasn't all going to be smooth sailing. And so in verse 15, he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Glorified means to give an account. And so they were giving a good account of him. Again, he is, his fame has preceded him. And in verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now, I want you to notice this. This was his custom. 
He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. This was his custom. Now, I'll tell you one of the interesting things about that. It's a little bit of a peek into Jesus' life before his ministry. Because as you know, we know hardly anything about the first 30 years of his life. We've got a couple little vignettes, but that's it. But one thing we are told here is that Jesus developed the practice, the custom, the habit in his life that he would go into the synagogue to worship on the Sabbath. Have you ever thought about that? This was his custom. He did this all the time. Have you ever thought about that? Why would Jesus go to church? Why would Jesus go to church? What could Jesus possibly learn from a simple country rabbi who had just a, a thimble, a fraction of the knowledge and understanding of the text that Jesus did? So why bother? Why would he bother doing that? You ever think about, I wonder how many bad teachings Jesus heard. I mean, now you and I, we, we've been there with that, haven't we? We've all, we've all been to church and we've, we've all been sitting, listening to a sermon and thinking, you know, what, what is this guy talking about? And whatever he's talking about, he's been talking about it for an hour. And then we look at our watch and we say, huh, really, Jonathan's only been talking for 10 minutes. It's amazing. Well, I'm probably going to hear about that. We, we've all done that. Don't, don't you know that Jesus heard a lot of teaching that was inferior? And yet, this was his custom. And so he would go to church, even though it was not perfect. And I'm sure there were times that the air conditioner made it too cold and sometimes too hot. And uh, maybe, maybe even though he knew that he could preach much better than this country rabbi. So why would Jesus go to church? Well, because as Jesus would say in John 4, True worship is in spirit and truth, and the Father seeks such to worship him. We said last Sunday when we were together, why, why was Jesus baptized? Well, because the Father wanted him to be. Why did Jesus go to worship? Because the Father wanted him to. There's no substitute for that. And so in verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. Now, the scroll of Isaiah would have been massive. This is, a, <clears throat> this is a scroll of Isaiah from the second century. And uh, it is, it's one of the few scrolls. It has the entirety of the book. And so this was, a, this was a very large thing, as you might imagine. And so the scrolls would have been, would have been large when the, all of this material was rolled onto it. I would imagine that every synagogue that Jesus went into, he was asked to, to teach and to explain. Because again, his fame had preceded him. But it's interesting that he takes the scroll of Isaiah and he knows where to look in the scroll. Now again, these scrolls would have been massive, particularly a book like Isaiah. Isaiah is 66 chapters just in our English Bible in the Old Testament. And it, it wasn't that Jesus had chapter and verse divisions where he could just thumb, you know, thumb index there in the scroll where he could go to Isaiah 61, which is where he's going to read. Uh, Chapter and verse divisions are going to be another 1,200 years before they come into play. But he knows what he's looking for because he wrote the text. He's looking for Isaiah chapter 61. Now, he could have read anything. And so think about that. If, if you had been Jesus on that day and you can read anything, what, what would you have chosen to read? i tell you what I think I would have read. I think I would have read Genesis 1 and 1. Only I would have reworded it a little bit. In the beginning... I created the heavens and the earth. And then for good measure, I think if, if he wanted to, Jesus could have, he could have just created out of thin air and earth and then a, and then a solar system and had that just kind of moving in, in, in the circular fashion, kind of hanging there in midair as, a, as an object lesson to the fact that he had created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what he does. He goes to Isaiah 61. And he goes to a passage that is clearly messianic. And he goes to a passage where Isaiah is, is talking about the fact that your sins have separated between you and your God. And here's what he reads from Isaiah 61 in Luke 4 and verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so Jesus goes to Isaiah. Isaiah, who 700 years before wrote 
20 chapters about Messiah. It's why the book of Isaiah is often called the fifth gospel, because he wrote so much about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. And for 20 chapters, Isaiah will write, and he will say, you know what? The Messiah you want is not necessarily the Messiah that you're going to get. You want a superhero. And what you're going to get is a suffering servant of man. And so Jesus, he will read the prophet's words, and then Jesus will say, he was talking about me. All the eyes, the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. You can imagine. You can just imagine, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody's getting antsy. Nobody is text messaging their friends. Nobody is looking at their watch. Nobody's checking scores on their iPhone. Every eye is fixed on him. And listen to what he says. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so he answers the two questions that he knows that everybody is asking. And he says, yes, he is talking about me. And today is the day. The time is now. Now, I want you to think about that with me, ladies and gentlemen, that that this was the mission of Messiah. That's what Jesus says. This is the mission of Messiah. What he just read from Isaiah 61. This is what Messiah has come to do. And yet it's fascinating to me that we rarely ever talk about those words. And we treat those words as though they have no relevance to 21st century ears. And yet I think it has every relevance to us still today because Jesus said, look, this is what Messiah was sent into the world to do. The Father has anointed me to do these things. And so this is important. And yet we never talk about this. He said, the Father has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, literally, Jesus did that. He literally preached to the poor. He made it very clear that his was a religion not just for the elite, that it was a religion where the money were not going to be able to buy special seats in the kingdom of God. His was a religion where you were not going to be able to buy a place with God. It's why Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel in particular, gives great emphasis to Jesus' care and concern about the poor, about the outcasts, about those in society that nobody wanted to deal with, but Jesus did. But spiritually, God anointed Jesus to preach the gospel to the poor spiritually. What did Jesus say in the mountain message, in the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who acknowledge your spiritual poverty. Blessed are those who acknowledge before God that they are spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are those who would say with Paul in Titus 3, it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And so he was anointed to preach the gospel to those who were willing to acknowledge, look, God, I, I can't save myself. And to proclaim liberty to the captives. Do, do we have no captives in the 21st century? Well, you and I both know that our sinful choices often enslave us. Sometimes that may be alcohol or drugs or spending or the internet or food or gambling or entertainment. What did Peter say? Whoever commits sin becomes a slave of sin. That's still today. And Jesus came to proclaim freedom to those who are captives. Now, maybe you're watching this afternoon. Maybe you're watching this afternoon. And like Israel of old, you're in captivity. Maybe you're enslaved to a habit that is destroying you. Or maybe you're enslaved to a relationship that's abysmal. Or maybe you're enslaved to a destructive behavior that is hurting you and those that that love you. Or maybe you're enslaved to an attitude or a thought or a word that is degrading in some way. It's amazing what holds us captive, ladies and gentlemen. Because usually our captivity is not like Israel who was enslaved by Egypt or Israel who was enslaved by the Babylonian. Usually our captivity is self-inflicted. And yet the Messiah came to set us free. And to give us the life that God envisioned for us. To give us the marriage that God envisioned for us. To give us the self-image that God envisioned for us. Jesus came to proclaim freedom to the captives. And it is still true that whoever commits sin becomes a slave of sin. That has all kinds of relevance to us today. And thirdly, Jesus said, to proclaim the recovery of sight to the blind. 
Well, literally, Jesus did that. And so in John 9, there is a man who was blind from birth, and Jesus gives him his sight. Or he's walking through Jericho, and uh, blind Bartimaeus cries out and, and begs for Jesus to give him his sight. And he does. But spiritually, spiritually, we are surrounded by individuals who are blind. And sometimes we are blind. As Christians, our eyes have been opened. Our theme this year in our church family is 2020 vision. Based on the statement where blind Bartimaeus is asked by Jesus, what would you like for me to do to you? And he says, Lord, open our eyes that we may see. But we still are often blinded. Even as Christians sometimes, we are blinded. Our world blinds us. We live in a culture that switches the price tags about what truly matters. We get blinded so easily. You know that old cliche, all that glitters is not gold, but sometimes the glitter of things blinds us to truth. Sometimes the glitter of pleasure blinds us to the consequences that may come from that. Sometimes the glitter of today blinds us to tomorrow. Sometimes we are blinded to the reality of our identity. Now, hopefully, Messiah has helped those of us who are Christians to recover our sight. And hopefully, we have our eyes open and we see who we are. Hopefully, we understand that before, listen to me carefully, that before we are Americans or Canadians, before we are Republicans or Democrats, before we are black or white, before any of that, we are Christians. And so Jesus said, look, the Father has anointed me to preach and proclaim recovery of sight to those who are blind. I love when I hear people say, how many times I've heard individuals say who are baby Christians. And when they are talking about that, then they are excited about that. And they say, you know what, when we first, when we first started coming to worship, everything was new and we didn't really understand. But you know what? It's opened our eyes. That's what Jesus was saying. And that's what he wanted to do. And then he said, the Father's anointed me to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Have we no oppressed among us? Certainly we do. Oppressed is an interesting word. It's a very generic term that refers to those who have been beaten down by something. Now, in the New Testament times, oppressed had to do with those who have been beaten down by sin or by demons or by sickness or circumstances or sometimes by other people. And so Jesus said, God anointed, the Father anointed me to set at liberty those who were oppressed, beaten down. Those who live under the oppression of ill treatment by others. Those who live under the oppression of, of guilt. A moment in their mind that is frozen in time. May have been 20 years ago, but it's still there, fresh in their memory. When they behaved in a way that they never imagined that they could have ever behaved. And, they, and the guilt, the guilt is still just eating them alive. Or those who live under the oppression of what life has done to them, or under the oppression of what they have done to life. And Jesus said, I'm come to help with that. This wasn't the only place he would say that, by the way. John 10 and 10. I am come that man might have life and that he might have it more abundantly. And so everywhere Jesus went, he was trying to give freedom, liberty, to those who were oppressed, to give life to those who needed it. And so, when Jesus saw Zacchaeus, he didn't see a filthy tax collector. He saw, what did he call him? A son of Abraham. He offers him life. When Jesus saw the woman who was taken in adultery, he did not see a hopeless and helpless sinner. He saw someone made in the image of God who was in need of forgiveness. When Jesus saw a woman at the well curb in Sychar, he did not see a biracial reject in society. He saw again somebody who had been made in the image of God. When Jesus saw the Roman centurion, he did not see a worthless Gentile pagan. He saw the faith in his heart. I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. What is he doing? He's offering him liberty. He's offering him life. Ladies and gentlemen, this passage in Luke chapter 4, why are we taking so much time with that? Why is it so critically important? And the answer is because Jesus is setting up here. He's giving insight here into what he's going to do in his ministry. If you want to see a great illustration of that, think about this. Jesus comes on the shore in Mark chapter 5. And there is this massive crowd that is waiting for him. 
And so this crowd just surrounds him. But in the crowd, there is a woman who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years. She has been bleeding for 12 years. She has spent every penny that she has on doctors who did nothing to help her. I think we cannot even begin to imagine the kind of sheer, utter humiliation to which she must have been subjected by physicians in the first century. And she's thinking to herself, if I can just touch Jesus, if I can just touch him, and she works her way through the crowd, and she does. She touches him. And Jesus could have just walked on. But he stops. And he says, who touched me? And the people say, well, Lord, there's so many people around you. Everybody's touched. And no, Jesus says, no, no, no. Who touched me? Now, he knew who touched him. Right? He is omniscient. He knew who touched him. And he's not calling her out because he wants to humiliate her. I mean, she's had enough of that already in her life. And she steps forward. And he says, she says, it, it was me. And I want you to listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Shalom. Go in peace. Daughter, don't miss that, ladies and gentlemen. He's saying to the crowd, this woman, this woman who has been unclean for 12 years and who just by virtue of touching me has made me unclean. This woman that you've had nothing to do with. This woman who is an outcast. This woman who has been exploited by others. This woman who has been completely disenfranchised from life. This woman is my daughter. You mess with her. You're messing with me. Now think about that in the context of Luke 4. Jesus has been anointed to come and do what? Well, he's come to those who are poor. And here is this woman who has spent everything that she has on individuals who evidently have exploited her. And she has nothing. And to bring freedom to captives. And here is this woman who is captive to an illness that makes her unclean. And to give freedom to those who are oppressed. And here's the woman who is oppressed by physicians who exploit and by people who ignore. And Jesus said, she is my daughter. And had he wanted to, he could have followed up and said, by the way, that is exactly what I said in my speech when I went home to Nazareth and preached in the synagogue. It is exactly what I said I had come to do. And don't miss this, ladies and gentlemen. The way that Jesus loved then is the way that he loves now. And what Jesus came to do then is what he does now. Verse 20 of Luke, of Luke 4. He rolled up the scroll. And he gave it back to the attendant. And he sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. No doubt waiting for him to give his teaching his explanation about what he had read and then no doubt wanted miracles and in verse 21 he began to say to them today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing what is he saying in that he's saying i'm the messiah i am the fulfillment of the prophecy today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing and by the way ladies and gentlemen in the first four pages of the book of luke this is the tenth time i believe that jesus is declared to be the Son of God, Messiah, the fulfillment of the prophets. Verse 22. And all spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. Now, this is one of those places where there should have been a period right there, and then another, another verse in our English Bibles. Because when you read the narratives, it is very, very clear that there is a change in sentiment, a shift in thinking, and certainly a change in words that comes right about here. So the people are speaking well of him, and they are amazed at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. But then they begin to think about that, and they begin to put the pieces of this puzzle together. Jesus says, as he reads from Isaiah, a purely messianic text, and then he says, by the way, Today, the scripture is fulfilled, which they all, now they begin to say, he's, he's saying he's the Messiah. I mean, they begin to put this together. 
he say that he is the Messiah? And then they said, the last phrase in verse 22, they then said, is this not Joseph's son? And so what they are doing is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is Joseph's boy, or at least we think he's Joseph's boy. Nobody really knows whose boy he is. But this is Joseph's boy. I used to babysit him. I had him as a student in the fourth grade at school. He used to play with my kids. Who does he think he is claiming to be the Messiah? And Jesus knows what they're thinking. And so in Luke 4, beginning in verse 23, he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Jesus said, look, I, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking we are your hometown crowd. We are your neighbors. This should pay off for us. Do some miracles for us. You're going to tell us that you're Messiah. You're going to have to prove that. We're not going to take your word for that. Do some miracles for us. And he said in verse 24, truly I say to you that no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Now listen to what Jesus says carefully, beginning in verse 25. In truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the heavens were shut up for three and a half years, great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was not sent to any of them except to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Now, there's a great story. We don't have the time to read it. But you can read that story in 1 Kings chapter 17. And Jesus reaches back into the Old Testament and he, and he plucks that story. And he says, I want you to remember the story where God made provision for a Gentile woman. A Gentile widow. An outcast of outcasts. A Gentile woman, widow, three strikes, you're out. And God made provision for her. And in verse 27, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And that story, as you know, is in 2 Kings 5. And Jesus, Jesus makes it clear there were lepers in Israel, but God chose to cleanse a Gentile soldier. Look at verse 28 of Luke 4. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. You may have a translation that says they were furious. When they heard those things, they were furious. Why? Well, because number one, both of those miracles that he uses in illustration were for the benefit of Gentiles. But even more, they know they're smart folks. And so they're reading between the line and they know that what Jesus is saying is, look, you are more needy than a Gentile widow, and you are in more need of cleansing than a Gentile general. And they are not going to hear that. And so they are furious with him. And in verse 29, they rose up. And they drove him out of the town and they brought him to the brow, the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him off the cliff. This is one of those places when you visit Galilee, that it's probably pretty clear where we are talking about in the narrative. Because here is, here is that precipice that no doubt they would have gone to. And you can see it just a little bit clear there. And in particular with this close up, and you can see you can see that somebody who is thrown off of that is going to go a long, long way and down, down a precipice, down the side of a cliff that is going to absolutely tear them piece by piece, bit by bit, till they are dead. Verse 30. But passing through, through their midst, Jesus went away. And so Jesus, they, they take him. They've manhandled him. They've taken him up. They've manhandled him. And now they're, they're taking him. They're dragging him up here. And, and all of a sudden, he's gone. It's only one of two times. The other being in the temple. 
when Jesus seems to have used his miraculous power for himself, for self-preservation. And so he, he disappears. And that's the end of this little account. But I want you to see, ladies and gentlemen, that this narrative sets the stage for what's coming in Jesus' ministry. Now, if you're taking notes on the handout, if you printed that out and taking notes, let me, let me give you four things to take from this really quickly. What, what can we learn from this narrative? Well, number one, we want to feel better. Jesus wants us to be better. These people just, they, they, wanted, they wanted a feel-good story. They, they didn't want to hear about God being kind to Gentiles. They, did, they didn't want to hear about what the Messiah wanted to say to them. They, did, they didn't want to hear Messiah say something that might be difficult to hear. They just want to feel better. And Jesus wants us to be better. And, and very similar to that, we, we want a God that will bless us, not change us. And so they say to him, Jesus, do for us what you did for the residents of Capernaum. Because they've, they've heard about all the miracles, all the healings that he did at Capernaum. And they're saying, we want you to do that for us. Let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen. Listen very carefully. Let's be really honest. How much of our prayer life is saying, God, bless me. And how much of our prayer life is saying, God, change me. What percentage would each of those be in our prayer life? God, bless me. God, change me. I got a feeling that for most of us, for me, for most of us, God bless me. Here's what I want. Here's what I need. Here's what I want you to do for me now. Would be the vast majority rather than God, God change me. And then number three, Jesus came to save us from our sins, not our problems. Now he does help us with problems, but it wasn't the primary purpose of his mission. He came primarily, as his name implied, Jesus. He will save the people from their sins. And so again, I would ask you, how much of our prayer life is spent on asking God to solve our problems and how much is spent on asking God to deal with our sinfulness? Again, probably those things are a bit out of proportion. And then fourth and fine, that we can either get rid of our disobedience or we'll get rid of Jesus. But one of the two has got to go. We either get rid of the disobedience in our life and if we're not willing to do that, we'll get rid of Jesus. And that's what they do. Who do you think you are? We know you. In Mark's account in Luke chapter 6, they also said, Isn't this Mary's son and aren't his brothers, James and Joseph, Jude and Simon, along with his sisters, here with us? In other words, we know him. We know who you are. You're Mary's boy. In a Mark's account, they take offense at him. Here's what I want you to see, ladies and gentlemen, as we end this, this afternoon. This episode, when Jesus goes back to Nazareth, it introduces the critical themes that will run for the remainder of the book of Luke. Don't miss that. In this little story that we've looked at today, Luke introduces the themes that will run in the rest of his book. Number one, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, verse 14. Secondly, Jesus' initial acceptance and then rejection by his own people. Oh, what gracious and wonderful words you're speaking. And then in the next breath, they're taking offense at him. Number three, God's love for the poor, the blind, the oppressed, the enslaved. God's love for people that nobody else wants to love. And number four, the prophetic nature of Jesus' work. I am the fulfillment of the prophecy, Jesus said. And number five, thankfully for us, God's love and provision for Gentiles. Because that's, that's who I am. That's probably who you are. I don't have Abraham's blood flowing in my veins. Thankfully, Jesus said what matters is whether or not you have Abraham's faith in your heart. Don't miss the importance of this story, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, the text says that he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. No wonder 
No wonder 2,000 years later in our churches we sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene. Because what he said in Nazareth on that day makes all the difference in the world today. Thank you for studying with us this afternoon. Let's pray together and we'll be finished. Good Father for Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord your son. Thank you so very much. We're grateful, dear God, that you anointed him to speak to us, to redeem us, to put hope and eternal life in our hearts. We pray, holy God, that we will live worthy of the name of your son that we wear and honor you today on this Lord's day. We pray in his name. Amen.